Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Relationships. They make up every human interaction and activity in our lives. Not only are they just a part of life, God made them integral into who we are. In God's Word, we find the ultimate guide in navigating conflict, relating to others, repairing broken relationships, and letting go of your past. Let's dive deep into the wisdom of God and get real. Good afternoon. It's good to see you guys. I'm glad to be with you. And uh, welcome to those of you guys that are watching online. Now, today we are going to continue in a conversation that we have been having about how to have real relationships, right? And uh, uh, I can't think of anything more important than being able to make sure that your relationships that you are in are authentic, they're meaningful, they're real, right? But in order for us to get that, we are going to really have to challenge the way that, uh, that we, we uh, behave in those relationships, okay? And so we're going to have to be able to engage in practices that might be foreign to us, but it's things that God wants us to do, and, it, and he knows that it would help us to achieve uh, this intimacy, this relational uh, exchange with people that is very meaningful. And I can't think of a better topic to talk about that really messes with our relationships than when we find that we're in conflict, right? So today I want to talk to you about being in conflict with somebody, and we're going to look at God's Word and at, look at how He wants us to navigate this, and so today we are going to look at navigating our conflicts like pros, okay? Professional folks, we can do this. All right, well, this is a very tough topic, I know, for many of you here uh, today, and so, um, yeah, let's, let's just bow your heads for a moment and let me ask the Holy Spirit to come even more. Thank you, Father. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you are present. And the Holy Spirit, I ask that you would fill every nook and cranny of this room today, Father. I believe, Father, that you told me that you have appointed those folks that are in here to be able to hear what you are saying today through your word. And so, Lord, I ask that the walls that might rise up with people, that you would bring them down. Let them know that they're loved, Father. Let them know that, Lord, and that they could be at peace and could sit with you today. I thank you, Father, for um, just being here. And I know, Father, all the distractions. So in the name of Jesus Christ, I ask that they would, the calamity would stop and that your peace might go present, Father, into this room. Yes, there you are. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay, as I said, our topic today is navigating conflict, right? And I was thinking, uh, thinking about something that had happened last month. I went to uh, Arizona with Andy. I, my whole family went. We were celebrating his father's 80th birthday. Now, I've been married to Andy for, she's getting close to 30 years, guys, right? And, uh, yeah, it's exciting. But, at, but so <laughs> I've gone to Arizona quite a bit, to Tucson right? So I know a little bit about it. But this last visit was, 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 I was having a hard time. They are three hours behind us. So that meant that I was getting up and it was still dark outside, right? And stuff. And so Andy and I decided uh, the days that we were there that we'd go for a walk in the morning time. And he took me to where he grew up. He grew up playing in the wash, which is where the mountains all come down in the water. And it's a gully down there. And uh, even though it's very brown there, <laughs> down by the wash, it's kind of, there's a lot of life. So as we were walking down there and talking, we were talking about uh, the uh, series that we're in, and specifically about the conflict, you know, series coming up, or the topic. And so as we were walking, I believe the Holy Spirit prompted me to stop, and to he said to me, Sharon, the people are a lot like the vegetation that you're seeing. <laughs> now, anybody that's been out to this southwest, what's the major vegetation out there? Cacti, right? There's tons of cactus everywhere you go, 
right? So there's cacti everywhere. And so I believe the Lord was giving me pictures and talking to me about this. And here's, I brought with you four different types of cacti today. I want to show you, and then I'm going to make some parallels with them, right? The first one is the granddaddy of the cacti family. It is the saguaro. I have a picture for you up there, right? It grows about 60 feet tall, weighs about 4,000 pounds, has these sharp, uh, thorny things that go all the way up, right? That's my son and his wife that were up there. They stood there for me to so get perspective. Well, when I first saw the saguaro, I thought, you've got to be kidding, right? I had no context at all. It looked like this alien tree to me, you know, and stuff. So that was my introduction to the saguaro, just being in awe of this thing that I couldn't even have any point of reference with. The next cacti that I, cactus I learned about was the barrel cactus, okay? The barrel cactus, just like its name, it's round. It's got these fiercely armored, sharp projections all around it. And you see Andy up there in front of his sister's yard with a very huge one, right? Okay, so now you got that in your mind? All right, here's a little fact about me. I love to plant things, right? I am a flower girl. I like that. So in my spare time, I love to plant flowers. And I have flower gardens I have established in my yard. And one of the things, my favorite things to do is to go down to like Lowe's or those places and go to the, what I call the skid row. <laughs> That's where they have all their plants they don't want and they just throw it there. They're half dead, right? And I go back there and I find those that are not, you know, that, are, that I think that I can work with. And then I rescue them. And I take them home, right? And then I find a place in my garden I think they'll be, you know, they'll do well. And I go there and I talk to them while I'm planting them, right? And I say, it's okay. I've rescued you, right? You're going to do good. I'm going to give you good soil. I'm going to pay attention to you. And, and so I have conversations with them. And, hey, here's the snapdragons next to you. They're pretty nice, right? And so I, I engage like that. And Andy always loves to come out when he sees me in my garden. And he says, what are your flowers saying to you today? And then I always have this wonderful story, right? Now, that's a bit on me. So we were in Arizona, and Andy's telling his mom about my love of planting flowers and stuff. And so um, she says to me, oh, I've really been wanting these flowers in my garden, you know, in my back area. Would you do that for me? I'm like, absolutely, right? She said, hey, my friend has just grown some barrel cactuses, and they're small. Can you go get them? <laughs> I'm thinking, Sure. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. When I went down the road to get them, you know, I brought my little box and stuff. You know, those, those barrel cactus, even though they're small, they weigh about 20 pounds per piece. And I had three of them, right? And I had gloves on, but their, their spikes are so spiky, they <laughs> kept scaring me, right? And so I'm struggling. I get them. I bring them back. And, and I go to put them into the ground. And how many of you know, in Arizona, the ground is concrete, Right? <laughs> And so I'm like slugging my guts out trying to do that, trying to get this plant into the ground who's porking me, sticking me, right? And by the time I get done with three, I step back and I'm like, oh. And Andy comes out and he goes, so what are your plants saying to you today, right? <laughs> and I look at him and I go, you're kidding. You're kidding. They're saying, get the hell away from me, lady, <laughs> right? The most hostile plants I've ever seen in my life. And that's the barrel cactus there, right? All right, now let me introduce to another cactus I know. It's called the prickly pear, and you see a picture of that up there, right? It's got these flat pads, and it does grow to about five feet tall, and it, but it has these spiny projections all over it, right? Now here's the cool part about what I learned about the prickly pear. They actually harvest it, and they get it for its nectar, and they make jellies and things like that, so they can actually use it. Of course, you have to get by all the little thorny things sticking out at you, right? And so today, um, well, when I was there, I thought about you guys. I had been praying about this message. And stuff, so I brought back some prickly pear cactus uh, jelly today. So those of you that came in, I want you to look at your uh, flyer or your program. And there should be one with stars on the front. And if you had that, I want you to stand up. And those ushers, they got that for you. Ah, right here. <laughs> Yay, right? <laughs> okay, so we've got some prickly pear jelly for you. I don't know what it tastes like. I wasn't brave enough to try it. So it's right there, right? Good. You can tell me later, right? <laughs> okay, so the prickly pear, it can be used. It makes jelly, which I think is, is very interesting. Now, the last one that I want to introduce to you, now this one gives me a hard time with this name, but I'm going to give it a shot. It's the jumping chora, right? Chor, 
Torah, whatever. It's that thing, okay? And this uh, jumpy Torah, what it, what it does is it's just like its name, and you can see it up here. Look at how hostile that thing is, right? <laughs> I mean, it's got a thousand little nettles with every arm that it has, and it gets its name to be the jumpy Torah, because if you get close enough to it, what it does is all those little nettles, they embed themselves in you, okay? So let me tell you my introduction to the Torah here, right? My introduction came early on when I went to Arizona. I had my three boys that are now grown, but the, at the time they were only five, six, and eight. And so Andy and I were going somewhere that afternoon, and the grandparents said, hey, we'll watch the boys. Now my boys are active, and so they decided to take them down to the wash to go for a walk, right? So they all get out, go out, and they're walking down to the wash. Well, my middle son, Jeremiah, has a lot of energy. So he decides to run ahead, right, because he's going to hide. He's going to find some place to hide and jump out at him. So he decides to hide behind the jumping Torah. Right? So he dives back there, and then the next thing you hear is, Grandma, I've been parked, I've been parked, you know, and he's screaming for help, you know, and stuff. And so Grandma, the next couple hours, is just trying to get these nettles out of him that's all over his hands and his arms. He's a little six-year-old boy. He's screaming, crying. She's trying to bribe him with anything and everything. And I'll never forget the day I, you know, when I came back that, that evening, uh, my two other boys, Samuel and David, they came running up to me, and they said, Mom, Mom, the cactus, it porked. It porked Jeremiah, and it's because he didn't listen to Grandma, <laughs> you know? And I was like, aw. So I went in, and sure enough, there is my son Jeremiah sent with his grandpa having his lollipop, and I go, oh, what happened? He goes, the cactus, it porked me, Mom, and it hurt. And honestly, Mom, I did nothing. I did nothing to it. And it just jumped and it porked me. But Grandma, she fixed it, right? I was like, oh, I looked at Grandpa because he was sitting with him. I said, so what happened with Grand uh, Grandma? He goes, hmm, she's in the back deck. She had to have a glass of wine, <laughs> <laughs> right? So I have this love-hate relationship with the cactus of Arizona, the cacti are, yeah. So if you notice, all the cactuses that I brought to you today, all the varieties and stuff like that, they all have one thing in common. What was it? They all had needles. Exactly. They had these porky projections that, that stab us. And I believe as I was talking and praying that the Holy Spirit wanted me to see these different things because I believe people are like that. I believe each and every one of us is kind of like a cactus, that we have those places in us for a good reason, that we have the protection just like those cactuses have protection because of the environment, that people have um, gotten their own protection, but they're... they're uh, yeah, they're pointy. They hurt, right? You get go to hug them, and it's like hugging a, a porcupine, right? It's very hard. And so when we're in conflict, especially, we feel them. And here's what I mean. These are some of the comments that get said to me that uh, I thought about the different cactuses that I had, uh, or cacti that I had uh, introduced to you, right? Like, I'll hear this. Sharon, I don't get him, or I don't get them, because they're, like, bizarre. It's like an alien species. I have no point of reference. That's your saguaro, right? No point of reference at all. It's kind of different. We're not used to that. We didn't grow up with that. The next thing I hear is something like, hey, I was just trying to help, man. I was just trying to help them to come to a peaceful place in their life. I was just trying to help them to, to transition, and they treat me like the enemy. It's like they're stabbing me. It's like by all their actions, they're saying, get the hell away from me, right? So we see our barrel cactus. Or I hear, Sharon, I know there's good in that person. I can sense it, and I see it, right? And I know they have the capacity to really help and to be good, but, man, those, those spurs, those needles, they, like, poke at me, and they come out, and they get me, and, and I'm not, I don't even think it's worth the good that I get. It's not that much, and I just don't think they're worth it anymore, right? Prickly pear. Or how about this one? I thought of... A conversation I had with a man that told me, he goes, listen, the moment I walk into the door, the moment I walk in, I go, I just sit down, I just turn the TV on just to check out the football scores, right? And she's jumping all over me. <laughs> she's just like, Ugh. and then she like shoots these needles at me, and all night long I'm picking them out. And I thought, ooh, ooh, that's kind of like the, the chumping choya, right? Okay. So people are a lot like cacti. 
they have these places, and when we're in conflict, they come out. And you and I are like a cacti. We have our defenses. They might look differently, but they're there. And so our job is to be able to understand that everybody's like that. And we need to put this in light of what God says, because you might be in a marriage or in a job, or you might have a kid that you're trying to work with, or a friend, and you go, help, right? I'm really trying to deal with this cacti, you know, this cactus of a person, and I don't know what to do. Well, first, let me reassure you that all of life is about learning to love people. It's about learning to love your God, right? your Father God, and it's about learning to love other people. And so God does not want us to throw away people, even if they're, they're rough, you know, and they, they have all these needles and they hurt us and stuff like that. God wants us to be able to, as his people, to know how to navigate conflict, to be able to set up the proper boundaries, to be able to talk with them, because the relationship is very vital and very important in the eyes of the Lord. The Bible underscores this so much that we see most of the New Testament, it talks about how to get along with each other, right? You can see it here in the Apostle Paul. He wrote in Philippians 1, 2. He says, if you've gotten anything out at all out of being following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, agree with each other, love each other, be, love each other, be deeply spirited friends. And so what you see here is the Father God wants us to be able to love one another, to work with one another. He says, actually, he says, this is a mark of maturity, right? That we should be maturing into that. We should have our minds transformed. And because this topic is so very difficult for so many people, and I understand that, and you might go, well, you know, maybe that doesn't mean that person. Let me show you what Jesus Christ did, the goal that he put out before us in Matthew 5, 9. He said, God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. You see, our identity and who we are, it's, it's found when we pursue conflict and we find the peace in that. And so we know we need to actively go after that. And I'm going to tell you, peacemakers are rare. Why are they so rare? Because it is hard work. Digging the ground to plant my barrel cactus, I thought, you got to be kidding, God. I thought this was going to be fun, <laughs> right? Boy, did I get a lesson. <laughs> Guys, sometimes in life we have people around us that are very defensive, very hard to work with, right? And we wonder if the pain is worth it. And God says, if you go and attempt, I will bless you. But he's encouraging us to be able to navigate through this. And when I'm talking about peacemaking, just in case you, you want to think it's something like being somebody's doormat or running away from, you know, a conflict or procrastinating and saying, well, it's not really there, pretending, no, 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 I'm not. You see, most of us, we, we handle conflict like our parents did. And so it's a very vital and important skill to be able to navigate conflict, and we can only do that with the Word of God, that we allow that to permeate our hearts and our minds. So on your outline today, I've given you three uh, biblical steps to being able to navigate conflict, and we're going to take a look at those. First one's a little bit longer because I put in some real practical steps for you, okay? So on your outline, number one, you always take the initiative and assume the best in them. You take the initiative, first blank initiative, and you think the best. That's the second uh, fill in there. Now, I'm going to separate those out. I want to talk about the first part. You take the initiative. That means you don't wait. You don't stand back. And it doesn't matter if you're the offended or you're the offender. When you know there's conflict there, you go to resolve it, okay? Very important. Matter of fact, Jesus underscores this by saying even when we're worshiping him, he says if there's a problem, you're to go and solve it. Look in Matthew 5, 23 and 24. If you enter your place of worship and are about to make an offering, but then suddenly remember a grudge a friend has against you, abandon your offering, look at that, abandon your offering, leave immediately, go to this friend and make things right, then and only then come back and work things out with God. So there's this underscore because worship is so very important uh, in a Christ follower's life, and he's saying, hey, even leave that element to go make it right. So the horizontal and the vertical relationships we have are being meshed together. They're connected, and we need to understand that and go after having this peace conference. Now, when you have a peace conference, 
it should be done face to face, okay? Let me say that again. It should be done face to face. There's this huge temptation to want to do it on social media, texting, and email, right? Because this, I can control myself, supposedly. But that's the worst way. You only inflame the issues when you do that, right? You need to be able to, to um, park up, right? And go in to find that person, to have that conversation. It should never be over those kinds of forms. Why? Because they need to read your face. They need to read your actions and, and when, when you're talking to them. So much gets conveyed there. And so I want you to make sure that you do this face-to-face, -face, right? And uh, only waiting and delaying only deepens resentment. So we need to be careful with that and jump on it. So I know, well, what if I'm mad, Sharon? Should I go when I'm angry? No. Take a moment, step back, and pray. God can handle your anger, okay? But once you get your composure, then you're to go forward. Now, God says in the second part of that, uh, that number one uh, biblical concept to give you was to assume the best in people, to assume the best in people. So how can we do that? Because if you're like me, when I get angry with somebody, what do we tend to do? We think the worst, right? We read into their motives all the negative things, right? And so it's really hard. But God wants us to reach for this best in somebody. And so what does this best look like? Well, you see this here in um, the Apostle Paul as he talks about it in 1 Corinthians 13, 5. This is the best. Okay? It says to love always believes. Love always believes, always expects the best, and always stands your ground in defending him or her, never looks back, but keeps going on to the end. And so you see like this enduring patience and long suffering with people and that's what love is. That's how God wants us to treat other people. Now, again, if you're like me, sheesh, that love falls just, you know, my human love just goes away, right? And so we really need to have the power of the Holy Spirit, which is God's presence in our lives. We need to activate it and call on it because none of us can love like this unless God helps us. And so that is the best. That is what God is looking for. And as we start to uh, position our heart like this, what happens right behind that is we need to know that when we go to somebody, that we need to treat them as we want to be treated, as it says in Luke 6, 31, do to others as you would have them do to you, right? So you need to stop and make sure, hmm, is this how I want to be confronted? And then that's how you're going to confront a situation, just like if they were going to do that to you. Now, remember I said this, I'm going to get very practical for you, okay? This is something I feel like the Lord underscored. So there are six things I'm going to quickly just give to you. These are things that you can walk right out of here today and do, okay? First one, and being able to set up this peace conference, is you need to set the right time, and the right time is what's best for them, not necessarily you. What's best for them, okay? Ecclesiastes 8, 6 says there's a right time and a right way to do everything. And so there is this timing element that we need to become uh, uh, aware of, you know? So just like our jumpy tour, we don't, when somebody comes in, just like, boom, bombshell, this is how I feel, right? Or this is what I see. You know, but rather, but rather we think about it and we set up a time and we go approach that person that we're in conflict with or that's been relationally broken. And you say, I've got some things I need to talk with you about, right? When's a good time for you over the next couple of days so that we can talk, okay? The next thing after setting that time is number two, you have the right attitude. You have the right attitude. What is the right attitude? Well, Ephesians 4, 14 says, speak the truth in a spirit of love. Circle that love, right? That should permeate our being, love. And so I have to think, if somebody's going to confront me, what do I want out of them? I want them to come and to be gentle and kind with me. You know, I want them to come with compassion and, and, and sincerity, right? And I want us to focus on the problem and not placing blame. And because of those things, that's, that's the way we come with love, right? We come that way. We need that. And so we give it to other people. And so I want to encourage you uh, when you're talking with somebody, especially about um, a problem that exists, to use your I statements. And what is that? I statement is I feel, I perceive. Not you make me so mad, <laughs> right? I need help. 
I need this. And so when we do the I statements, it, it helps to put the frame around that conversation of no blaming because we all drop into that, that blaming and, and stuff. And if you're the one that's being confronted, it's never easy to be confronted by somebody. And so the natural thing is to have your defenses go up. And I want to encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to keep your hands down when somebody's talking to you, not to be defensive. And I know you want to correct their facts, <laughs> you know, or you want to speak to something they say because it rouses you up. But try not to. Instead, just try to listen. And maybe jot a note down uh, if they say something you want to come back to, okay? Now, here's how I deal with some things in my home. <clears throat> and I know this is hard to believe, but yes, Andy and I sometimes get in an argument, right? He's beautiful, he's wonderful, he's funny, but sometimes I want to rip his little head off. <laughs> it just is. I'm a sinful lady. Okay, so... Here you go. When I get into those situations and we have our peace conference, right, we're going to talk and stuff. One of the things that keeps me very honest because I can lie to myself, I think like many of you, um, you know, that, oh, yeah, I'm just going to do it for your good. <laughs> whatever, whatever. Okay, so here's the thing. I envision Jesus Christ standing there with me. He's my third party. It's Andy and me and Jesus. And he's listening to everything I say. And I'm going to tell you, nothing in my life is worth losing my relationship with him. Nothing. And so when you invite the Lord into your conversations, into those peace talks, he has a way of being an equalizer in the room. The next thing here is to make sure not to sabotage the meeting. Every one of us has the ability to go in and to sabotage a meeting and derail it, you know, by gunny sacking and pulling all kinds of stuff out. But we need to know that and be mindful. Proverbs 12, 18 says, Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, right? But wisely spoken words can heal. And so you and I need to know that in our mouth, we have the power of life and death. And so in our mouth, we need to be very thoughtful, very conscious, uh, very controlled in the words that come out. We need, to be, we need to be very mindful of that. Now, to my uh, female audience, right? I love being a girl. I'm so glad God made me this way. And I love the fact that he has given me this full range of emotional uh, domain, right? And I love to access everything. But here's what I found. Male counterparts, whether I'm married to them or I, uh, or I work with them, they can't keep up. They just can't keep up, you know, when the emotions come out, right? So I have learned, especially in a conflict situation, that I lean more into my, um, my logic side right? And I rein in those emotions a little bit, and it seems to help. It seems to help. So there you go. You got a freebie on that one, all right? <laughs> the next thing is for my guys. Here's what I saw. For 57 years, I've been working with you guys. What I see, I see that most men will start to enter into a conflict situation like they would one of their athletic events. There's a winner, <laughs> and there's a loser, right? But let me just remind you something. There, that doesn't work like that, especially if you're married, because if she ain't happy, you're never going to win, okay? I'm just saying. I'm giving you free wisdom here, right? You need to be looking for the win-win on both of it, and so you need to tell yourself, oh, that's my teammate. If she doesn't win, I don't win. Got it? Okay, good. Now, those might not be your issues. It could be other things. doesn't matter. There are natural uh, challenges we all have, and so we need to know that they could enter in and sabotage our meetings. The next one, number four, is to be cooperate uh, as much as possible, to be cooperative, right? And we see the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, 18 says, do everything possible, circle that word possible, on your part to live in peace with everyone. So that's what we need to endeavor to go after this being at peace. What does that look like? And I'm going to tell you, peace has a very high price tag, right? You know, the price tag that we have to pay here is usually our pride and doing what we want to and our self-centeredness, which we all struggle with, okay? And that's what has to be uh, laid out before the Lord, and we have to put that down. We need to know when we go into a peace meeting where we're in disagreement, there is a compromise that needs to take place uh, in there, and so you're going to have to make some adjustments on what you want, okay? And so you need to go in there with that mindset, because if you do, then it goes a whole lot better in that meeting. The next one is very important, is to emphasize uh, reconciliation, 
over uh, resolution. So this is a perspective that you have when you go into the meeting. Reconciliation, what is reconciliation? Reconciliation is looking at the relationship, right? Whereas when we look at resolution, it's just solving a problem. Reconciliation, right? Resolution. Reconciliation means that you're more concerned with a relationship. And it's a game changer because if you're more concerned with the relationship there, then you're going to stop and ask yourself, how can I be uh, in relationship, be at peace in this relationship? And you're going to ask yourself those questions. And all of a sudden, the problem is not so huge. Okay? It starts to learn, lose its strength. And so we need to know that we are called to be reconciled to people, right? Not always to find the, the solution, but to be reconciled to them. And this is hard work. And I know that some of you guys that are in conflict right now, the truth is it's tough for you. It's really hard. And, and I want to encourage you because you're going to have to have some boundaries around what does this reconciliation mean? Right, and in order to do that, because it's so specific to your to what's going on in your life, you need to have a small group. You need to have some Christ followers who are around you that can help you to outline what does that need uh, to look like. You know, to have those boundaries, but we need to pursue them because we are a people that are called to be able to be reconciled. And we see with First Peter three eleven, it's hard work. It says hard work at living, do the hard work at living in peace with others. It's going to be hard work. We need to know that. We need to go into it. And we need to understand that it is hard. But we are called to do that. The last one I put here is, is, is another one that I see that we have such a hard time doing. But we need to be able to learn to attack the problem and not the person. And I specifically went in and laid this one down because when we're having difficulty, where we're in conflict, we look and we look at the person and go, you are the problem, <laughs> right? We want to place blame, but that's really not true. They might be part of what's going on there, but there are other things. They're not your enemy. And if you have to fix blame, you're never going to be able to really get to the uh, resolution in the relationship there. Okay, so you need to know that. In uh, Proverbs 15.1, it says, A gentle response diffuses anger, but a sharp tongue kindles a fire. And so we need to know that what we say and how we say will uh, either bring in, uh, usher in peace or it sets your house on fire, sets your work on fire. And so you need to think through, th through how you talk to people and watch how you don't attack them. And I know when I say attack, you think, well, no, I don't go in and punch somebody, right? But when you say stuff like um, yeah, the comparison and you compare them negatively, right? Like, you're just like your dad, who you hate, <laughs> right? Or like, you compare them like, why can't you be like your sister, right? Those kinds of things, those are jabs, those are the pricklies, those are things that hurt people. And so we need to know that a gentle word will actually get you where you want to go, right? And those uses of um, just using your tongue and your words that way, they only cause to set everything on fire. Now, how do I identify... With, uh, with a problem and not attack a person. In Proverbs 16, 24, it says, a wise, mature person is known for his or her understanding. The more pleasant his or her words, the more uh, persuasive he or she becomes. You know, if I want to get my way, if I want to be able to get my point across, then I need to be pleasant at it. I need to think through my words, not attack somebody, and uh, respect the other person hearing. And I know you're going, well, yeah, but what if they don't respect me, right? Well, here's what I'm going to suggest. Just step back. Let them finish. And when they're done, you step in and you say, let me clarify why we're having this peace meeting today. And you reiterate that, that you are, they're very important, that reconciliation that's very important to you, that they're more important than the issue, and that you want to find some resolve here. And so you go back and you do that, and I dare you to ask them, this one question, did I offend you? Usually when people get defensive like that, it's because we've offended them. And so when you ask that and if they say yes, then you just go, wow, that wasn't my intent. I didn't mean to do that. Sorry. And uh, you know what? You're so important to me. This relationship is so important to me that I want you to call me out when I do that. Not only that, I'm going to call you out when I feel like you're attacking me. 
right? And so now you all of a sudden, those are boundaries. You put those in. Very important. These six steps I just gave you, I went over them quickly. Here's the deal. They're very practical. You can do them anywhere, anywhere at any time. And it's almost like, I was thinking about this, it's almost like ping pong. You know, when I first started playing that, it was hard to paddle back and forth to keep a volley going. But the more you practice this, the better you become at it in your relational exchanges, especially when you're in conflict. Now, there are two other foundational uh, principles I want to make sure that you look at before we leave today. Number two, right, is to sympathize with their feelings. I can't underscore that enough. It's important to recognize somebody's feelings. And, and maybe it's just me. I don't know. I'm kind of like mm, a person that goes, just tell me the bottom line. I just want the bottom line on this thing, right? I don't want to hear all the wah, rah, rah, rah. Yeah, aren't you glad you're not married to me? Okay, so, so I have come to realize God got my number and said, don't do that. That devaluates somebody. You must be able to hear their emotions, hear their feelings and stuff before you try to solve anything, before you move in to establish. You need to let them talk. And so uh, Paul says in Philippians 2, 4, Look out for one another's interests, not just your own. So it doesn't matter that that's my personality. Let's get to the bottom line. I need to stop. I need to listen. And in there, I see where he says, look out for. That means to pay attention. What am I paying attention to? I'm paying attention to their, their feelings, right? I'm clued in with the feelings that they're, they're giving me, not just the word choices or the facts that they might have wrong. I'm listening to their feelings, and I know this is a skill that we have to learn, to be active listeners. And when somebody's talking to you, you just go, okay, yeah, yeah, okay. That doesn't mean you agree, but it's validating somebody sharing something uh, with you. And so we need to be actively listening. And listen, feelings, they are not logical. They're just not, okay? Matter of fact, they're illogical. A lot of times when our feelings start to run ahead of us, they make us do such foolish things. Wouldn't you give me that? Man, they make me do foolish things. Actually, I found this scripture. I think it was for me more than you. <laughs> okay, this one is King David, right? Mighty King David in the Bible. This is what he says after he gets his feelings hurt in Psalm 73, 21, 22. He says, when my thoughts were bitter and my feelings were hurt, I was an stupid as an animal. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, right? Yeah, that's true. When our emotions get all riled up and stuff, we can really act quite foolishly. And I thank God that David wrote about it because now I feel like I'm in good company, <laughs> right? So if they get the better of us, God is saying, hey, I understand. But then he gives us this scripture here in Proverbs 19:11. He says, this is what I want for you, though. A, wise, a man's wisdom comes from his patience. It is to his glory to overlook an offense. Circle that offense. We need to push back and not to get offended is really what's happening here, right? People don't want to know what you know until they know how much you care. And so if you're all about getting offended, then you can never get there. And we really need to sympathize with one another. And the Apostle Paul, leave you this last one, and I'm beating this one because I know it's hard. Romans 15.2 says, We must bear the burden of being considerate of the doubts and fears of others. Let's plead... Uh, Let's please the other fella, not ourselves, and do what is good for him or her, right? To do what is good for them. And so when you look at that, it talks about the sacrifice of long-suffering and, and about being patient. It's the fruit of the Spirit right there. It's just kind of laid out for you and I. And it says that's what we need to be able to do. And I know it's uncomfortable, and I know it's hard to absorb anger and frustration that's unfounded, that's coming at you, right? But here you go. Didn't Jesus do this for us? Yeah, he did. Jesus did that for you and I. He endured malicious anger and insults on our behalf so that we could be saved, right? Christ sympathized with our needs, right? He sympathized with our needs. He knew we needed to be restored to the Father, and so he gave us grace, and he walked with us, and that's what he wants of us. He wants us to be like him. He wants us to be children of the God most high. And that's why he lays that out. And so we need to be, that, be there. We need to hear people. 
The last thing I want to leave you with is we need to learn to release the offender and replace your hurt with God's peace. To release the offender and to replace that hurt with God's peace. So when I'm talking about releasing the offender, I'm talking about forgiving them. I'm talking about letting go of the hurt, right? That's what I'm talking about here. And I know for some of you, it's so horrific what was done. And you think, how could I ever forgive? It's so hard, Sharon. And for some of you go, well, I've said those words, I forgive you, but I still hurt inside. I want to talk to you for just a few moments about this thing, right? Listen, why should you forgive? That's a question that's been going on for a very long time. We even see that in the scriptures with Peter when he talks to Jesus. You know, in their culture, in their time, if somebody offended you and you gave them three tries and they still messed up, you could say, you're out of here, buddy, right? You're out of here, girl. But then, so Peter came into this conversation talking to Jesus, and he says to Jesus, how many times should I should forgive my brother, right, who's, who's offended me? And he thinks he's being magnanimous. He's saying seven times, <laughs> right? And then Jesus blows his mind away. And he says, no, 70 times seven. So what is he saying? Jesus is saying that the hallmark of following him is a group of people that know as their mantle to forgive those that have offended us. Right? To forgive those that have offended us. Why would he ask that of us? It's so very hard. Why? Because every time you and I choose to for, forgive somebody that has offended us, what we're doing is we're saying, Jesus, I know what you did for me. I know how much you had to forgive me. And I have no choice but to forgive other people. And so it's a demonstration. Every time you choose to forgive, it's a demonstration that you understand what was done for you. Colossians 3.13 says, never hold grudges. Remember the Lord forgave you, and so you must forgive other people. You must forgive others. It's not think about it. It's an actual you must do this. You must allow yourself to enter into that forgiveness process, right? We're not allowed to hold unforgiveness towards somebody. Yeah, but Sharon, what about the pain I feel? I can say I forgive you, but what about this pain that's inside? What do we do with that? Well, here you go. I, like you, have had places like that, and I have learned that it would not defeat me. What I do is I vision what happened. I look at that person. I say, I choose today to forgive you. And every time I feel a pain or an angst come up, I repeat that. I forgive you. I choose to forgive you because, Father, I know how much you have forgiven me. And then I even recount of all the things he's had to forgive me for. And because I have been forgiven much, I love much. I offer forgiveness. It's hard, but I offer it in light of what has been done for me. And I would beckon to, to, uh, to bring to your attention, if you cannot forgive people, if you struggle with that, then I have to ask you, do you have this personal relationship with Jesus Christ? That's the very first place I go because I'm like 99.9% .9 sure that if you can't forgive other people, it's because you don't feel forgiven. You don't feel forgiven. And so if you're far from God, if you've not given your life to Christ, in a few moments I'm going to close, and I'm going to give you the opportunity to give your life to Christ. And if you have given your life to him, and you have stepped forward and said, yes, Jesus, I want your salvation and I want your leadership, let me tell you, you're not following his lead if you can't forgive. If you can't say that, yes, I forgive you, for something, then you're not following this lead. And I know that sounds so hard, you know? It sounds so hard when the Lord was bringing it to my attention. I was like, Lord, come on, what about this? What about that? Which is what we normally do. And this is what the Father gave me in James 4, 1 and 2. What causes fights and quarrels amongst you? You want something, but you don't get it. You do not have because you do not ask God. You see, we're looking at a person, a human being, to answer things that we need inside of us when only the Father can answer them. And as long as you look at another human being to, to fulfill or to give you what you need inside, you will always be wanting. And you will hold people in, uh, you know, that they owe you something. That you can't give them forgiveness. You can't condone what's happened, right? But when you look at it through the eyes of Jesus Christ, and you know that he's got your answers for you, and you go there and you sit with him, you allow him to fill you up. Then you can turn around and you look at that person that's offended you and you go, 
I don't need anything from you, and I release you. Only through the power of Christ can we do that. And let me tell you, as one who struggles and finds her fulfillment in this, I can tell you when we decide to go into conflict, right, that we're fearless and we go into conflict and we handle our situation like this, what happens is in Colossians 3.15 that the peace of Christ will come and it will rule your heart. You'll be able to have that peace that seems so elusive to you right now. And so today, today, Jesus Christ is here. He's been speaking to us and speaking to me about this whole idea of conflict. And he's saying, and he's going against our culture that would say if somebody is a, a porcupine and they've been porking you and they've been hurting you, right? Our culture says what? You're out of here. Here you go. God says no. My people who are called by my name will do something different. They will be examples. They will be like lighthouses that rise up and will shine for all mankind to see that my ways are different. And I will love and I will be able to forgive because I am one who loves, who has been greatly loved, and who has been greatly forgiven. That's what Christ wants for us. That's his message today. Bow your heads with me. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you've been active and you've been here today, Lord. And Father, uh, the topic has been so difficult. But yet, Father, I know that you love me. I know that you love this group of people and that you have come to see us set free, Father. So, Holy Spirit, I ask that you continue to work in each heart that had ears to hear what your spirit was saying this morning. I thank you that you love us so much that you won't leave us like we are. You will not allow hypocrisy even to, to reside within us, that you call it out. And so, Father, I thank you that you love us enough to come and to show us how it's supposed to be done. And that you forgive us where we've fallen short. Now, I hear the first and major conflict that happened was your, your choice of sin over a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so for those of you who do not have a relationship with Christ or you've walked away from one, hey, the Father's calling you back. It's your choice. It always has been your choice. And so I want to encourage you uh, today to pray with me this prayer. And all those that have already prayed a prayer of salvation, they're praying for you right now. And right where you're at, you just say, Father God, I want what that lady's talking about. I want to be able to forgive, and I want to walk free. And so I choose today to accept your son, Jesus Christ. And Jesus, I ask that you'd forgive me for my sins, those places I've blown it. And the best I understand, I ask you to be the leader of my life today. Okay. Now I'm going to pray for those that were praying that. Father, for all those that were praying that, I thank you that you seal it in their heart, Father, that you've written their name in the book of life. And Father, I ask that the Holy Spirit would begin to empower them to release people, to be able to forgive people that have wounded them and hurt them. And Father, for us that are your children, called by your name, I thank you, Father, that we are to be your image bearers. And like all things, Lord, I know that we absolutely cannot do this without you. So I lift all those that had ears to hear what your spirit was saying, including myself. And we cry out to you, Abba, our Father, to come and do what only you can do, that you would empower us to be peacemakers and that we would run after Christ in his ways above all ways. Now I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are always with us and mindful of us and that you're a forgiving God and that your mercies are new every morning. We love you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. 
don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.